I want to uh, read now from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. I'm going to read from chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And this is a story that's commonly referred to as the widow's offering. If you'd like to read along in your pew Bibles, you'll find this passage on page 67. 67 of the New Testament. It begins, As he taught them, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law, who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace, who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They take advantage of widows and rob them of their homes and then make a show of saying long prayers. Their punishment will be all the worse. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare of their riches. But she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. I'd like to begin this morning by telling you a story about someone in a Christian church who had a bad day. In fact, this person had a really bad day. You see, arrangements had been made with certain members of the congregation to cater a small luncheon reception as part of a day-long church event that was taking place in their facility. It was a pretty standard situation. The usual soup and sandwich lunch with pie and squares for dessert, something the kitchen crew had prepared many times before. But later that day, the chairperson of the group whose lunch was being planned called the church kitchen to inquire about some special dietary needs that had emerged. Well, that simple question unleashed a firestorm of a response. The leader of the kitchen crew became most indignant, and as the conversation went on, her temper grew hotter and hotter and hotter. Her rant went something like this. You people always think you can waltz in here and demand whatever you want from us. Well, it's not going to work this time. Either you eat what we put in front of you, or you go hungry. I'm not going to make a special effort for whoever doesn't happen to like what we serve. And by the way, even if you don't eat, we expect all our food costs to be covered. Seems to me that's the least you can do since we're the ones who have to put up with you anyway. I'm glad Kathy Woodowis isn't here to hear, <laughs> to hear this, but that has nothing to do with Kathy, by the way. <laughs> Thank God. And with that, the kitchen crew chief hung up in a huff, and the committee chairperson who was trying to arrange the event sat back, shaken and dumbfounded, by the lamb basting she had just received. It had been a bad day for the spirit of Christian hospitality. That's for sure. And not just because of the harsh words that had been spoken in this telephone call. 
there were other issues going on. It was apparent that the kitchen crew chief was involved with the project, not because she wanted to do it, but rather because she felt she had to do it. She believed that she had no choice. A sense of obligation and duty was driving her. Rather than any spirit of graciousness and welcome in Christ. After all, she probably thought, there's nobody else that will do this. Well, the meeting went off as planned, although I'm not sure who ate or who paid for what in the end. Turns out as well that the crew chief, who was so upset on the phone, is also the chair of the church's friendship club. As I said, it was a very bad day all around. Now, I'm telling you this story because it's funny. And it's ironic, but it's also very sad. It's sad because this story, and others like it, ring true for at least some of us here today. Many of us have had similar experiences with church folk who aren't enjoying themselves in the Christian community. Can any of you relate to this story? Do any of you have a similar story going on in your own life? The scripture story of the widow's offering that I read is often portrayed in ways that don't sound very appealing either. Because preachers, they often point to this story as somehow as God's call to every one of us to do more, to serve more, to give more money, to give more of our time and our effort, and so on and so on. But the story of the widow's offering is a story we frequently read as a challenge to, to better live up to the demands of congregational life, doing our share going the extra mile, bearing more of the load, and so forth. That's true. But this isn't how it's supposed to be in the church. It's not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be a community of abundant love and grace in Christ. Demands and duties and obligations. They may be the way if you're a hockey parent who's called to fundraise on behalf of the team. That could be true. Similarly, endless demands and thankless assignments may be the way things go in our workplaces. But there's supposed to be a different atmosphere here. In this, in this organization we call our church. It's supposed to be different. Well, folks, if we look more deeply into this powerful little story from Mark's Gospel, I think we'll find something important that connects directly to this issue. If we consider the background of this poor widow, then I believe we'll see a different way of living and giving. And we'll get closer to the, to the point of being a church, of being Harrow United Church. We'll see the difference in values that actually sets us apart from those 
what I call dreary organizations based on obligation and guilt and shame. First, consider the life situation of a woman whose husband has died in Judea in Jesus' time. Judean Jewish society at that time was a patriarchal culture. All financial wealth, all social status, why even your personal identity were attached to the male side of the equation. Sound familiar? You don't have to look far in our own cultural history to see similar things. People in ancient Judea were named and known by their father's identity. And inheritances were passed directly from father to son without any provision whatsoever for female heirs. Females, in fact, needed to be socially attached at all times to a male either a father or a husband, even to go into the marketplace. To say nothing of having access to money or to social status. And the patriarchal nature of Judean society extended even beyond death. If a woman's husband died, then her brother-in-law's family took over administering her affairs. Failing that, the woman would have to return to her father's household if indeed he were still alive. Which makes it very significant that here in Mark's Gospel, the woman at the temple is referred to explicitly as the widow. The widow. And because Jesus talks about this woman as a widow, we know two things. First, the woman's late husband has no extended family right? who could assume care for this woman after his passing. And the woman's own family must have gone too. In other words, she's completely on her own. Secondly, the widow Jesus is talking about would be one of the poorest of the poor in Palestinian society. She had no social standing and little, if any, access to financial resources necessary to support herself. Are you getting a good picture of this poor woman? And yet, as Jesus says, she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had all she had to live on. So here's the question. Why on earth would this widow do a thing like that? Why would a poor woman in this kind of life situation give all she's got to her place of worship? What the heck was she thinking? It's pretty clear to me that she wouldn't do such a thing merely out of a sense of duty or obligation. The simple effort of trying to make ends meet day by day, that would be hard 
all-encompassing work. So hard that there'd be little energy or resources left over to fulfill other obligations like giving to the church. Who in that kind of circumstance would have what it takes to give even more of yourself away? There must be something else going on here. Some other aspect of this woman's life experience that moved her to give all that she had. There must have been a bigger point to it all than merely a sense of religious obligation. It's not because of duty and social expectation that this widow gives all that she has. Nor is it because there's nobody else to do what needs to be done. That doesn't cut it. It's because somehow this poor woman, left on her own in the world, has experienced, I believe, the redeeming, the empowering, and the life-transforming touch of the living God. Even in the midst of all her life's difficulties, this woman whom Jesus encounters has been lifted up somehow, turned around by her God. And in heartfelt response, the poor widow gives all that she has. And that, friends, I believe, is the point of the story. That's why we're drawn here together in Christ as the congregation of Harrow United Church. That's why we're here. Celebrating and experiencing over and again the redemption, the strengthening, the transformation of hearts by the love of God. That's why we're here. That's the point of being a church. It's why we're here. It's why we give of ourselves with abundance and enthusiasm. And you cannot mistake it in this church. So this morning, I invite you to let go of all the shoulds and all the oughts about participating in a Christian congregation. I want you to just throw those aside. I ought to do this. I should do that. I invite you to let go of all the duties and the obligations that seem to get forced upon us by the tides of life in the world. Push them aside. And let go of that sense that there's nobody else who will do it. Nobody else will step up to the plate. It's not the point of being and of growing and of sharing in the spirit of Christ in this church. It's not why we're here. Take a moment now Instead, to look around you. Breathe deeply. Breathe it in. What I call the holy atmosphere of God's presence in this place. In this sanctuary of the Spirit. I want you to look around and consider the powerful symbols all around you that mark this place as a sanctuary of the Spirit. A space devoted to the presence of the living God. I want you to reflect for a moment on the times you felt 
within this space, the power of God either in word or in sacrament or in musical expression. Think back. And now look at the people who join with you here in celebrating and honoring the transforming spirit of Christ as it moves within and between and among us. Just look around. Go ahead. I dare you, look around at God's people gathered here this morning. People who are ready, through the Spirit, to make a loving difference in their community and in the world. That's what it is to be church. To be Harrow United Church. And ask yourself, what really is the point of giving, participating, sharing yourself, and your abundance as part of this living community of Christ. I dare you, look around. Breathe in deeply. And then celebrate. Be joyous. Celebrate with prayer and with thanks. That's the point. Otherwise, we're just another of those dreary organizations. And I would hope that the people together said, Amen. Hymn number five.